Hi everyone, and welcome back again.、Uh, today we're talking with the inimitable and otherwise awesome Bradley Trevor Greve. Hi, Bradley. Thanks for coming on the show. Good day, Christopher. Lovely to be with you, albeit via this virtual virtual tether. Indeed. Now, this is kind of an unusual interview because we actually did this interview in person.、Uh, we recorded it in an awesome、uh, Korean barbecue restaurant. Unfortunately, the background noise was so loud that、uh, all you hear are banging dishes behind our amazing, amazing interview, which maybe someday we'll get a transcript of and people can bask in the awesomeness. Well, exactly, and I got to tell you, all I can promise you from this point on are varying degrees of disappointment because without Korean barbecue to fuel the conversation, I, I have a feeling this is going to peter to nothingness very, very quickly. Indeed. Now, for those of you who don't know, you've—I、uh, mean, you have one of the more I think unusual、uh, resumes I've ever heard of.、Um, so why don't you tell people a little bit about yourself? Aside, aside from the fact that you are an author, because I've been talking and interviewing with authors. True, we have that in common. We have a lot in common, not just our spectacular beards, but、uh, and our love of the great outdoors and a limited sense of self-preservation.、Uh, so yes, my name is Bradley Trevor Greve. Everyone just generally calls me BTG, my initials.、Uh, I was born in the un- on the untamed island of Tasmania. A little triangular island state to the south of Australia, the last place to get a good cup of coffee on the way to Antarctica. Very beautiful, very wild place.、Uh, Tasmanian devils in the forest, penguins, and great white sharks、uh, on the coastline. It's a it's a really beautiful place that I I love. And for me, being in nature and loving nature probably stems from where I come from.、Uh, but when I was a young boy, my father won a scholarship to continue his medical studies. At the Royal College of Surgeons in、uh, Scotland, so we headed overseas. So I actually grew up in Scotland, England, Wales, and then we moved to Asia, Hong Kong, and Singapore, and returned to Australia to finish my schooling, and、uh, then joined the military. Went through the equivalent of、uh, West Point. It's called the Royal Military College, Duntroon. Graduated, went to the Infantry Corps, then managed to make my way into the Airborne Forces as a paratrooper, platoon commander. Specialized in heavy weapons and anti-handling devices, among other things, and、uh, mine warfare. And、uh, then I had a horrible health setback. I contracted a tropical respiratory infection while on a job with your seals in the Arafura Straits. And when I came back to base,、uh, it was quite cold and wet, and it just took a hold of my lungs and like a big pulmonary shutdown, and it pretty much killed my uh, my uh, combat service career. And so I, I basically, at the age of about、uh, my early twenties. Started a whole new profession, and having done,、uh, having committed、uh, so much blood, sweat, and tears to my previous profession, I felt that I had paid my dues, and I was entitled to pursue my creative passions. So I started off as a cartoonist. I'm a very visual person.、Uh, worked as a cartoonist for a newspaper in Sydney, Australia, and uh, then uh, eventually managed to have a book published. And、uh, we can talk about it in more depth. But suffice to say, my background. Is a combination of wildlife, wild places,、uh, and、uh, and killing people who absolutely deserve it.、Uh, so it's a military background, but I think of myself as a humorist, as someone who prefers to be in the great outdoors, and so all my other experiences stem from that. And I have been through the Russian space program. I've entered、uh, traditional Polynesian games in、uh, the Pacific,、uh, but all those experiences come back to a love of writing, a love of books, and a love of nature. Uh, that that's certainly quite a quite a set of experiences there. Let's talk about your book for a minute. I have to say, I really enjoyed the Blue Day book and、um, some of your, your other books that I've read. I would highly highly recommend them to anyone who's watching this.、Uh, but you're also working on your first fiction novel now, aren't you? I am,、uh, but、uh, yes, I've, I've done two things that I'd never normally do,、um, and I've, I've been looking forward to it for some time. I've produced. Uh, well, that's a lie. I've done nonfiction works before with、uh, books on biodiversity and cats and dogs, and I enjoyed that. And I, I just recently finished one about Bertrand Russell, which is the first historical biographic book that I've done. But yeah, I'm really excited. I'm finally mustering up the courage to change genres and to try my hand. What's that?、Uh, we had a, we had a Skype problem there. I was going to ask you what、um, when can people expect the Bertrand Russell book to be tentatively coming out. I think if we're lucky, it could be out for Christmas. I'm a bit busy at the moment. I have a visual gift book,、uh, really beautiful story.、Uh, I told you about when we were、uh, we caught it last time for lunch about this、uh, little bird that was rescued in Australia by a family who'd gone through a, 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 a very deep tragedy, 
and the in a, in a strange twist of fate, the little bird actually ends up rescuing the family. It's, it's actually a, a true story, and it's uh, it's very weird and beautiful. A woman breaks her back on a family holiday, and uh, and becomes a paraplegic and falls into depression. And by rescuing this bird, the family is reunited. It sounds like a Disney film, I know, but it's completely true. And the photographs are unbelievably beautiful. Uh, and so I decided I couldn't say no to that project. So I'm finishing that now. That'll be out in May next year. But the longer-term project is the one that I'm most excited about. And I fuse my passion for adventure travel and wildlife and uh, foreign cultures all together in a book about the brown bears of, of the islands off the coast of Alaska. And I've decided to, even though everything in the book will be based on fact, the story as itself is obviously pure fiction. And so it's been very exciting. I've been working on it for about uh, two years, and uh, I don't know what to expect because people don't know me as a, as a fiction author, but I... I don't care. I, I enjoy it so much, I don't care. I just hope it goes well, but I, at the end of the day, I'm loving the process of writing it. And you've been doing what might be accurately termed uh, extreme research, haven't you? Ah, yes. Uh, yeah, don't try this at home. Remember, you're talking to a guy who's had 17 or 18 surgeries and five treatments for rabies. I once got a sexually transmitted disease in my eye when a koala urinated in my face. So... You know, I'm that guy. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I do a lot of work with wildlife. Some of your viewers might recognize me from my appearances on these late night TV shows, bringing animals onto these late night talk shows. So I'm obviously I'm experienced in my conservation programs. I know what I'm doing. But this has been a thrill. No. So I go up to these remote islands off the coast of Alaska and I spend time tracking these brown bears. And I, and, uh, I do it with the Native Americans who live there, the Klingit. Uh, and their culture is the reason that I'm there. I wanted somewhere with a very unique indigenous culture that also had plenty of brown bears. And places like Kutznawu, which means Fortress of the Bears, has the largest brown bear population in the world. And it is the main Klingit population now as well. Mm -hmm. And I love it. I mean, it's terrifying. You're out there all day in the forest. We spend a lot of time in the boat, move around these islands. And then we, if, we, if we're downwind, we'll stalk these bears and... Uh, and observe them, take thousands of photographs and video and lots of measurements. Lots of, uh, a lot of it's not very sexy. A lot of it is taking you know, samples of poop in the rain. But uh, I want to see what they're eating, how they're behaving. And these are big, big bears. You can fit, uh, an, you can fit two or three uh, interior grizzlies into one male Alaskan brown wow. bear on the island because they have so much more food. Uh -huh. They have access to uh, very nutritious plants all the time. Obviously, they get the fish run, which is very important. And they also eat the deer and they eat any kind of carrion. Uh, there's no moose on this island and there's no black bears. And you know why? <laughs> because they all got eaten. <laughs> Every now and then, a moose swims across. Uh, a moose, as you know, can swim great distances, mm -hmm. very powerful swimmers. And they're dead within hours. These big bears Jeez. move 35 miles an hour. We're talking... I, I, yet to see an adult brown bear under 800 pounds. This is almost sounding like, a, like, like the plot of one of the Jurassic Park movies where you're getting dropped into the, <laughs> you know, the velociraptor enclosure to, to do research. Well, you know, it's, it's funny because when I'm doing it, I look very calm and composed. And remember, mm -hmm. I, I, I was in the Special Forces, so I know, I know a little bit about how to keep my head together when things are going badly. But I prepare myself mentally before I go out. I don't normally carry a firearm. Sometimes I do for personal protection. Usually I just take bear spray. But my Klingit hunter and guide, uh, Alvin Johnson, who's also known as Raven by the Pond in Klingit, he carries a weapon and so forth, and he is watching my back. I don't go out in the woods alone. That's, that's how you don't come home. So uh, he's watching my back so I can focus right. on photographs and making my notes and checking the maps and looking for spore all that stuff that I need to do. So I make sure that someone's there watching my back. But when I'm out there, I've already rehearsed in my mind the actions I will take under certain circumstances. And a lot of it's common sense. You know, you never cut a bear's path off. Bears are very binary. They move A to B in a straight line whenever they can. So if you walk across that line, you've immediately brought attention to yourself and you intruded their space mm -hmm. and they have to make a decision about whether you constitute a threat whether you or opportunity and bears don't like to think you know theirs is a, is a very violent 
uh, fear-based culture and they don't like to stop and think. And so you don't want to put them in that position. Uh, but the point is, during the day, I'm out there all day with these bears, trying to be careful. And I, I feel sometimes I'm definitely going to get killed, but I just stay as calm as I can the whole time. And it looks like I'm super composed. But when I get back to where I'm staying in my little hut and I go to bed, I have nightmares about being mauled. <laughs> So it's very stressful, uh, but I absolutely love it. And I think anyone else who went out there would love it too. Any stories from your, your times going on the talk shows with the, the various animals? Because I've seen a couple of your appearances, appearances, and half the time it looks like you're trying to uh, uh, keep the blood from showing after something's bitten you or stabbed you or clawed you. Well, you know, I, I come from a very serious and very credible conservation background. You know, I'm the governor of a a huge facility in Australia, the Taronga Foundation, uh, Taronga Zoo, and I sponsor something significant in each of the 115 countries where my books are published. So I've been involved in these pro programs for many, many years. I've invested many millions of dollars in them, and I don't want to betray the values that I have in how animals are treated or talked about. So one of the things when they asked me to come on these shows, I said I would do it. But firstly, I don't take the money. I give the money back to wildlife carers. Mm -hmm. And two, I refuse to use any trained animals. I only mm -hmm. use animals that have been confiscated, rescued, rehabilitated. That's it. So when you see me there with a big cat or whatever else, that's not a stunt cat that was in a movie that was trained to, you know, to turn on an iPhone or whatever. It's not – That's. it's just – it's probably a, a cat that – some rich jerk felt, I got a billion dollars, I'm going to have a pet tiger or a pet this or a pet that. And then sure enough, it ate their dog or it mauled their kid or it was getting sick and thank God a fishing game got them and arrested them and, and uh, removed the cat. That cat or whichever animal ends up at a sanctuary and those are the people I deal with. So the TV people love it. They can't tell me they want an animal to misbehave because that would be illegal to encourage that kind of misbehavior that might harm a guest or the animal. But that's exactly what they want. And because ethically I won't use the other animals that will just sit still and do things for you, I never know what's going to happen. I never know. <laughs> I absolutely never know. And, uh, and so, you know, one time I ended up getting quilled by a porcupine pretty, pretty uh, impressively through the belly, uh, uh, bitten by just about everything. One of the funniest episodes didn't actually happen in front of the camera. We were backstage, and the problem with even a big TV set, as you know, is that it's bright out front, but it's dark out the back. And animals, particularly hoofstock, ungulates, they hate a harsh transition from light to dark or the reverse mm. because it makes them temporarily blind, and then they panic because they think, if I was being chased now, I, I, I wouldn't be able to get away. So I was at the back with a reindeer, and reindeer have just incredible <laughs> antlers, and he was freaking out, and we were just trying to shove uh, you know, vegetables into his face for him to eat to calm down, and um, I put my hand on his forehead and just said, you know, hey, settle down, big guy, you're going to be fine. Now, I'm, I'm a big unit. I'm 300 pounds and six foot three and change, but he is, maybe he's a lot shorter than me, but he's 400 pounds. <laughs> And his center of gravity is much lower. Reindeer have the largest antlers of any uh, deer in the world except for moose. So it's a huge mm -hmm. spread of antlers. And uh, when the males are in the rut, which is he was, they're only thinking two things. They want to have sex with something or they want to kill something or they want to eat. It's only those three things. So by touching his forehead and just saying, hey, take it easy, he felt that slight pressure, thought I was challenging him and just went straight through me. And just, and just about took off my left nipple. Um, anyway, I know from experience that I'm going to get injured and get blood and poop and all sorts of stuff on me. So I take like six shirts and uh, we just quickly went backstage, took that, the shirt was torn to shreds, banded it over the nipple, <laughs> mopped up the blood, put the shirt back on and went back out and did the show. That happens all the time, something like that. Not as dramatic as that, mm. but... Uh, there is, you know, wild animals are not pets, and 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 doesn't matter how much you wish they were, they're just not. The domestication process takes thousands of years and many generations, and calling an animal a pet does not make it so. 
Uh, unless, of course, unless, of course, we're talking about foxes and you're in Russia. Well, only if only specifically if you're talking about that silver fox program. Is that what you're talking mm -hmm. about? Yeah. yeah. But see, you know, that again is is incredibly selective inbreeding to yeah. produce uh, a much more docile uh, breed of fox. But I guarantee you that it's no better than those ridiculous savanna cats, you know, F1, F2, F3, um, crosses between uh, servals and cats. You know, that uh, I, I say that anyone who wants to get themselves a, a serval or a savanna cat, I say, here's what you do. Just get a chainsaw, go out the back, smash everything, cut it up, then go outside your house, cut down all the trees and burn them because you'll never see another bird ever again. So if that's what you want, uh, you know. So yeah, you can you can get some pet animals, and you can have relationships with wild animals. Of that, there is no doubt. But it is not going to be something that you can control or contain the way you would a normal house pet. That's for sure. Yeah, that, having having grown up in Montana and been around a lot of wild animals, that uh, rings very true for me. And uh, it was one of the things that really influenced. Uh, when I was writing the dragon Sephira and just animals in general, and I think it's a, I think it's a sad thing that more people don't have experience with wild animals growing up because it gives you a perspective on life that you don't get when your entire environment is controlled, and the only animals you really interact with are other humans. Um, there's a, there, there, there's the, again, this might be overstating things, but there's a bit of a purity in interactions with wild animals because. Uh, the priority of the way they prioritize things is very simple in some ways. You know, is it are we going to fight? Is it is it uh, are you a mate? Are you a prospective mate? Are you food? Uh, are you you know? And if not, maybe you know, are you are, you, are we going to play together or are we going to ignore you? Whatever the whatever the hierarchy is, it um, it, uh, it it brings things into very it brings a clarity to that your interactions with this other being at least. That's been my experience. I think you're 100% correct. I think the illusion, the great lie of the digital age is the perception of connectivity, that somehow you can be anywhere uh, at the same time, you can be anywhere you want. But you're not. You're in your room, you're on the subway, you're in a restaurant, you're in a hotel, and you're connecting through this portal that for all its sophistication is little more than, you know, uh, two tin cans help connected with a string. I mean, it's this very tenuous connection to the other, to elsewhere, to the outside world. And there is a genuine belief amongst people like myself that we uh, have generations of what we call nature-deprived people. And I don't believe you can be a whole person if you don't have the opportunity to experience a connection with nature. Not some fruity, tree-hugging thing, uh, but just get out there and smell the fresh air. Purely from a selfish point of view. Just selfish. Not anything to do with saving the world or anything noble. None of that. From a selfish point of view, uh, you owe it to yourself to get out there, get to the untamed edge of the world and experience it for yourself while you still can. Because it's disappearing. And I say that as someone who's been to whichever edge you think of going. I've been there. And it's disappearing. But it's still amazing. It's still wondrous. And it's still there to be seen if you'll, you know, unplug and go on a plane and get on a boat and put on your boots and step in some mud and some shit and, uh, and walk in the woods. It's still there. And uh, you come back a better person for it. Going to spend time in nature makes me a better person. Well, thank you so much for uh, – uh doing this chat with me. I'm glad we glad it worked out that we were able to get a new version of this. Um, and uh, if, if we ever get a reboot of Aragon made, uh, I'm definitely, definitely going to see if I can get you cast as an Urgle somewhere so you can yes. run around with a giant sword. I, I have been back in the gym since you hinted that. <laughs> I'm lifting. People can't tell, but I am bulking up again. I'm eating steak like five times a day. I want to get to 400 pounds. If you were going to get me there as an Urgle. And uh, yeah, no, I would love that. I think that's very exciting. Your books are so cinematic. Uh, I felt that the initial movie, though worth a look, didn't live up to the potential in those stories. I think we all agree on that. So to get out there, and I hope you do pursue that, I compel you. <laughs> 
to look at opportunities for the rest of us that you need to do that. Guaranteed. Well, again, thank you so much for doing this conversation. And uh, from, for everyone who was watching and listening, thank you so much. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the conversation. And do go check out the Blue Day book and all of other Bradley's other works. I know you'll love them. Cheers. Ha, 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 ha.